Hello and welcome to my channel. This is a short video about disc cone antennas because I was getting interested in making broadband antennas for listening over wider frequency ranges and the classic of those is the disc cone. In fact the original antenna would be, there I come back, this one which is uh, one that I featured in earlier videos. This is a biconical dipole. So if you put it this way up um, there's a cone at the bottom and then at the top there's another cone pointing up. But if you take off the upper cone and replace it with the disc, then you've got a disc cone and then this upper cone is virtualized, um, like it's reflected in the disc, the plane of the disc. Just like a ground plane is a virtual dipole because the dipole has a lower half and an upper half. If you take away the lower element and replace it with a plane, like the disc on the disc cone, then suddenly you've got a, a virtual um, lower half of the dipole here that's been replaced by the plane. And you can do the mathematical calculations to work out how that works. Anyway, enough theory. And um, let's go back, look at that thing again. So there's the disc cone antenna that I made. And <clears throat> let's have a look at how to calculate that. So this is a calculator. There are quite a few online calculators for antennas. This one is <clears throat> the one I seem to like using. They all come out with roughly the same results with some variation. This one is 3G minus aerial dot biz is the website. I'll put that in the link below in the description. And this is a theoretical disk and a cone, which is not what I have, of course, but I've got something that hopefully gets close to it. The important parameters are the diameter of the disk D and the length of these radials pointing downwards, which form a virtual cone, that's LS. That's the most important. And then what I do is I check I've got it right by measuring the height of the thing when it's finished, which is LV, and the um, <clears throat> diameter. I don't always use C, I'd use D, but anyway, the diameter here of the points at the bottom of the cone, that's C max, just to make sure it looks about right. And if it doesn't, then I just bend these until they fit. Um, so to do the calculation, I wanted something that would cover 70 SEMs, 433 megahertz, and also mesh-tastic frequencies, 868. So I played around with this calculator and I found if you put in a minimum frequency of 350 megahertz, just by trial and error, then when you press the calculate button, the results is shown below. Refresh your browser page, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Uh -huh. Oh, there it worked. I'm not gonna edit this video. So that's for 750 megahertz. I want 350, and if I type in 350, it's going to switch cameras. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Calculate. Um, so there we are, there's 350 megahertz. And you can see the figures that are produced there. And um, seems to be, uh, yeah, it's working. <laughs> Sorry about that. So putting in 350 megahertz as the uh, minimum frequency gives you these results. Um, the important one, as I said, is the diameter of the disc on top, 171 millimeters, and <clears throat> the length of the radials, if you want to call them radials, is 238 millimeters. So I've uh, constructed that because you'll see that the optimum bandwidth for this antenna theoretically should be 410 to 10 to 30 megahertz. So it'll cover 70 centimeters um, and the mesh tastic frequency and a bit higher. I could have gone a bit lower to give a lower resulting frequency here and that could have come down but anyway the higher the frequency the, the shorter the elements and the less material you need so um, let's switch to a picture of the antenna itself hopefully we can see that and that's what I ended up making these um, rods are made from brass all of the parts came from Amazon by the way order online comes next day so this is a three millimeter diameter brass rod, which um, is easy to cut with a small hacksaw. This is the disc, this is the cone, and I've mounted all of that on uh, an N-type socket. Here's an N-type socket, which is nice and solid and mechanical, stable. And this is actually a different socket because it has a longer PTFE spacer here before the pin for the center conductor. I didn't know these were available, so the one that I bought, in, which is in here now, has got a much shorter PTFE spacer, which uh, reduces the distance from the cone and the disc between them, and it makes it a bit fiddly to construct. In fact, these things are very fiddly. <laughs> um, the next one I made 
I use thinner wires because that's all I had on one of these because it's easier with the construction, but it's not working so well at the moment. So um, what I did was I also bought from Amazon two copper discs. There's a um, 25 millimeter disc under here. And I think this is a 19 millimeter or 20 millimeter diameter disc on top. And these are meant for jewelry makers to make pendants or earrings or something. But of course, being a technical person, I drilled holes in them and soldered to them. Um, <clears throat> what I can do is show you what I did. It's a bit of a mess. Um, if we look at the top part of the antenna, I've soldered these uh, elements on. Actually, I soldered those first, and then there's a hole here for the center pin from the end connector to come through. When I tried to solder that, of course, the elements dropped off because the disc heated up and the solder melted. So the next time I make one of these, what I would recommend to do is to solder the center pin onto the connector first and then the elements. And what I try to do is use a, a fairly low powered soldering iron that's enough to heat the solder to solder the element but doesn't heat up the whole disc so that the other elements drop off but it still happens from time to time it's a bit like one of those whack-a-mole uh, things where you have to uh, use a hammer to hit the animals as they pop up and then as soon as you try to hit it and it pops up somewhere else it's a bit like this it's a bit of a game but uh, i did it in the end and the lower you can't really quite see but the uh, the lower Elements are also soldered onto the bottom disc, and then there's a couple of uh, screws with nuts on. The spacing between these, this vertical spacing is supposed to be three millimeters. I haven't even measured it because it is what it is, and the thing seems to work. That's the, the main thing. So this is experimental, of course. So um, that is the ground plane that I made. There's a uh, thin piece of coax RG316 with a SMA to N type adapter there so that I can have an SMA cable, which comes out at the other end to my VNA. And the display on my VNA freezes from time to time. Maybe that's a power saving option or something. I haven't checked, but if you click on the screen, then it wakes up again. So what I'm doing here, sorry, this is not an autofocus camera, so it doesn't look very sharp, but I'm um, sweeping from 50 kilohertz to 1.5 gigahertz. So it's 50 kilohertz up to 1.5 gigs. The yellow curve is the SWR in one per division. So a perfect match will be here at one, that's two, that's three. And at 870 megahertz, the marker, this one here, this is giving me an SWR of about uh, 2.08. One, two, three, yeah, just below three. So it's about 2.8, which is not the best for transmitting, but I wanted this mainly for receiving. And the disc and antenna is not going to give you an SWR of one across its bandwidth. Between two and three is kind of normal, I think, for this kind of antenna, because it's very wide band. And um, so you can see it works okay here at 870 megahertz. If I move the marker down, you can see it going down there to somewhere near 70 cells. Let's try 435 is the closest I can get it. There's the marker there. And you can see that the bottom end of the 70 centimeter band is just where the SWR curve starts shooting up. So it's a bit close. Maybe I should have made the antenna a bit bigger so that this line moved to the left, but this is how it is. So I'm getting an SWR of two, around about two on 433 megahertz. Sometimes I use 446 to talk to local stations who aren't licensed radio amateurs, which is great. We can talk to each other using radio. So I want this antenna to work there as well. And there's 450, so it's also about 2.2 SWR. So um, the antenna works after a fashion. This peak here um, is just an artifact. I played around with another version of the antenna using thin wires where I could snip them off and solder them back on again and experimented. And this peak you can move around and uh, I tried different length elements and then you end up with all kinds of peaks and dips. And it, it really is very, very messy. So I'm going to stick with pure disc cones with all the elements the same length. Um, here it's a super match. That's at uh, 1.08 gigahertz. And um, the SWR is about 1.15, which is amazing. But it's supposed to be a broad band antenna, so ideally this should be flat. So that is the disc cone antenna. Um, in another video, I'll be experimenting a bit more. <clears throat> what I'll do is... Um, try measuring some gain characteristics of the antenna and comparing it to other antennas. The problem is that to measure gain, you need an isotropic radiator, which nobody's managed to make yet. It's a bit like a perpetual motion machine. Um, it's impossible to make 
and if you get close to it they're incredibly expensive for laboratory use so I'll probably end up using that disco that I just made and pretending that it's an isotropic radiator and only using it at a single frequency and then calibrating the VNA to take that into account and also a long cable I bought the other day, five meter long, um, fairly low loss cable to connect so that I can have a test range five meters long and calibrate everything out so I can measure antennas against each other. And I'm going to um, try testing antennas not only for the gain along the transmission path, um, but then to check the polarization. So they're going to start vertically polarized and then I'm going to go horizontally polarized to see what the rejection is between vertical and horizontal for different antennas, because I've got quite a few now, as you've noticed if you've been watching these videos, and that'll be interesting to see. I'm not going to measure beam width of antennas because then you need a compass to measure the angle, and there are so many reflections in this room that the results will be meaningless. You can get a rough idea of the beam width of the antenna, but nothing measurable. I really should go outdoors and do this in the open field. Um, if anybody's got a field near Brighton, let me know, <laughs> or a big garden, I'd love to come and use it. Because making measurements in the room, the reflections are enormous. And the, the window here has got a, some kind of metal coating on that blocks a bit of RF. Certainly it's supposed to block UV, but of course it reflects. So I put an antenna in front of it, then it uh, makes it into a reflector antenna. So there's a lot of variables. But this is amateur stuff. It's a hobby. And it's fun just playing around with uh, the equipment. And you see, I've imagined that for the mesh-tastic equipment that was being sold out for a while. I think also Amazon's running out of VNAs and, and N-type adapters and stuff because people are going crazy. If you look at the other YouTube videos, a lot of people are doing these experiments. So it's reviving interest in uh, telecoms and electronics and it's uh, helping sellers to make more money. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. Please, uh, if you enjoyed it, like and subscribe and I look forward to reading your comments. I try to answer them the same day and uh, suggestions for new videos. So thank you for that. And let me know what antennas you've tried out. I'll be trying more. I think I want to try J-Pol sometime in the future because that uh, should be interesting and there's a lot of activity with J-Pol antennas. So, see you in the next video.